Changing a tire can be a hassle, but imagine changing a tire that weighs more than your car. That's one of the many problems that our next entrepreneur solved. John Collins is a 50-year veteran of the tire industry and a three-time entrepreneur. In the 1960s, John was a construction worker when he was introduced to OTR, or off-the-road tires. I was working in Wichita, Kansas on the Cheney Dam, and I'd become friends with the tire, we called them busters, today they're tire technicians. But in the day, I got acquainted with this young man that was changing the big off-road tires, and it really intrigued me to see this these big tires being changed. So he uh, confronted me one day and asked me if I would like to do that type of work. I said, I'd love to. He said, we have an opening in Oklahoma. We, have, we had a uh, man killed on the job. So, you know, at that point, uh, 20 years old, you know, they had no fear, if you will. And so I packed up my wife that was eight months pregnant and we jumped, put everything we had in the little 53 Chevrolet and we went to Oklahoma. John had been hired by the Firestone Tire Company, or so he thought. And it was kind of interesting when we got there, I, uh, on Sunday, I contacted my uh, boss-to-be and told him I was the replacement coming down to change tires. And so he asked me if I had any experience, and I said, none whatsoever. But I said, I'm an old Kansas farm boy. I know how to work, so I, I think I can make you a t hand. First of all, he said, well, Kansas farm boy, you just as well go on back to Kansas because you'll never make a tire man. And so I pleaded with him a minute and he said, okay, be on the curb at 4.30 in the morning. We're going to work. I said, great. The rest of it's kind of history. But I went to work and started changing tires. As I got into it and started learning the trade, I found out that there was no real tools had sledgehammers, crowbars, log chains, and that was about it. So that's when, you know, after a couple years, I started to realize that we need better tooling. So I just started developing things to make my job easier. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. If I'd have a problem with something, I'd start figuring out how I could do it easier. John's tools made him more efficient than other tire technicians. One customer was so impressed that he invited the Firestone office and John's boss to come out and watch. They came out to watch me change a tire one day. And when I got all through changing the tire, my boss said, where in the world did you get all those tools? Because most of the tooling on my truck was homemade and or tooling that I had found in other applications that would work. He and then asked me, he said, well, have you applied for patents? And I said, no, I hadn't. And so he said, well, I suggest you do. Firestone let John retain all rights to his tools. Shortly thereafter, John left Firestone to start building and marketing his tools. But things got off to a slow start. I was manufacturing the tools in Louisville, Kentucky, and I was about to starve to death. And I had even taken a part-time job trying to help support. But there, uh, the tire industry had a show every year in April in Louisville, Kentucky. So I thought, do or die. I went and got a big tire, about a six-foot tire, went downtown Louisville and rented me a brown tuxedo. <laughs> I put this tuxedo on and I changed that tire in a tuxedo for like three or four days during that show. And needless to say, we took the show. Every time I started the truck up and flipped that tire around, took it on and off the rim in a tuxedo, people crowded in. And one of the spectators was the president of IMT. And he spent a good bit of time watching me. By the end of the show, he offered me the job to come to Garner and start his crane division. And I said, Mr. Zrosik, I got to tell you, I know nothing about marketing, nothing about selling. I have no education. I, my education has been in the School of Hard Knocks located in the Valley of Opportunity. And his comment was, I think maybe you know more about marketing than you think. 
You just sold me. In the late 1960s, John was hired by Francis Zaroski, president of Iowa Mold Tooling, or IMT. IMT is located 10 miles west of Clear Lake in Garner, Iowa. Today, Garner is a community of close to 3,000 people and is known as the tire service truck capital of the world. When John arrived, IMT was the only game in town. Without an engineering degree, John launched IMT's crane division. Up until this point, we were handling tires with slings and chains. And the tires were getting quite large and it was quite dangerous. I scratched out on this piece of scratch paper somewhat what looks like a clamping device and I took it into the chief engineer. So I said, visualize this. If you walked up to your Volkswagen and you knelt down and you grabbed the tire, you squeezed it. Now you pull it off and on and you rotate it and you tilt and you tip it. I said, we have to figure out how to do something like that with equipment because these tires are getting too big. And after I went through all this, this engineer was somewhat of a character, but he said, Collins, get out of my office. I have work to do. I said, okay. So I went into the president of the company and I shared with him. And Francis was much like myself, an old farm boy. And Francis said immediately, he says, hey, come on, let's go to shop. We can make this happen. And that's exactly what we did within about two weeks we had a tire, the first tire hand, built of some sort. The rotation mechanism was even a manual crank, but it worked. By 1982, IMT had become the largest manufacturer of tire handling equipment in the world. And we went, the tire hands went from the little tire hands to the bigger tire hands, actually the tire hands that went on big forklifts and front end loaders. So we, we had that market captured. The market that I saw that we had no, it really didn't have captured, was a small tire dealer. The local co-ops, the independent tire dealers, they couldn't afford these big trucks. And consequently, that's when I said, you know what, we need to build a small crane, knuckle boom crane, put it on a truck, so we can then put these small dealers into, into doing service. Now, the, the, the consensus was that there's just not a big enough market. We're not interested. Believing in his new idea, John quit his job at IMT. He pulled together support from local investors and started his own business called Collins Equipment Company. Despite its success selling machines and reaching a multi-million dollar sales mark, the company struggled. At the same time his business was struggling, John faced an incredible hardship in his personal life, tragically losing his wife. Shortly thereafter, he also lost his father and then his brother-in-law. His life was at an unbelievable crossroads. And uh, the pressure, yeah, I guess, I don't know if I can even describe the pressure that I had, but at the end of the day, I come to uh, understand that I would rather have my health than all the money in the world. And that's when I made the decision uh, to clean up everything, get out of it, and quite frankly, January 1, 1990, I went back to work for IMT. I had exactly zero. I owned nothing, and I owed nothing. The sale of Collins Equipment Company to Stellar Industries gave John a clean slate. Back at IMT, John started coming up with new ideas. One of these ideas was to remanufacture used equipment and provide it with a new warranty. Once again, his idea was rejected. So John left IMT for the second time and started American Crane. I had a dream that equipment should be rebuilt and so again on a shoestring I went out and I purchased five old trucks that were out of service and I brought them to Garner and I hired a local firm to help me process them 
and you know, and what we did was probably not the best, but we got them processed and we got them painted and we sold them and made a little money. And so that's how it started. And then I later got at my own shop and got my own people, started developing special tooling for doing it. For 10 years, John grew his company, finding more success than he had ever had before. He now employed nearly 30 staff members. Then in 2008, when the nation's economy was in recession, John's company took a hit. Well, that's just, you know, the economy was down, the orders were down, so we had, we had nothing to build really. You know, we had employees that had been with us for some time since we started. It's just tough when you have to lay off people that, because you know, we're a small company and it's more like family. And it's kind of like laying your brother off, you know, or your sister off. It's a tough deal. Scraping to get by, John was looking for more work to keep his remaining employees. As luck would have it, a well-known tire company came to him, looking into the remanufacturing process. Bridgestone Tire and Rubber came to town, and uh, the manager that they had at the time, he said, let me ask you this. If I sent you a piece of equipment, a big crane truck, to remanufacture, how would you determine how to do it? And I said, well, it's pretty simple. I said, we don't, we wouldn't check it out. We'd just tear it apart. I said, there, you know, we don't know until we get it torn apart to what it needs. But the crane components uh, would, would go to sandblast, then inspection and miking. The cylinders would go to the cylinder shop, get torn down, inspected, remanufactured, put back together, and then everything would go through paint and then be reassembled with all wear, wearing components new. Bearings, bushings, hoses. This would all be new. And when we put it back on your truck, it would have new warranty. And he said, that's what I call remanufacturing. He said, you're gonna be my man. John's company and staff was back to full strength. For several years, Bridgestone kept the entire shop busy. Then just as fast as the contract arrived, it was taken away. In 2013, the bottom fell out again. And uh, quite frankly, Bridgestone changed management. The new management came in and made the decision he was not going to rebuild. He was going to go all new. So the, the good news is the business all stayed in town with our competition, and that's good. Uh, Consequently, we lost all of our business with them. And so, because what happened there for a couple, three years, we had so much business that we had ignored going out trying to get new business. And that was a tough lesson because after we finally got through this initial shock of not having the business, we immediately started, of course, back out traveling seeing our old customers and getting, getting that uh, business back up and it's come back real well. Since 2013, John has seen his company steadily recover. His 50 years of experience, numerous innovations, and patents have earned him a place in the Tire Industry Association's Hall of Fame. None of this would have happened if he hadn't taken a risk and followed his passion. You know, I've often asked myself, why didn't I just stay with corporate America and be like everybody else, just do my job and go home and, and go fishing and go hunting and all those things I love to do. I could have been retired and be sitting on the beach. That's just not the way I'm made. I like the challenge. You know, the challenge of the chase is sometimes more rewarding than the satisfaction of the catch. And so it seems like my life has always been in the chase. <laughs> Just southwest of Hudson, Iowa, stands a farm that has been family-owned since 1864. 
Like many other farms, this dairy operation has been passed down through many generations. In 1975, Jay and Gene partnered with Jay's father and his Holstein herd. What makes their farm unique is that they not only raise and milk cows, they also process the raw milk and distribute products directly to consumers. But it wasn't always this way. While raising their family, they ran a fairly typical dairy farm. We were a family dairy farm. We had approximately 100 cows, a little bit of hired help so we could get some time off. Uh, it was pretty gruesome, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We'd get off on the weekends when the hired help took over once in a while. Even with the extra help, the whole family had to pitch in, including their daughter and four sons. Working on the farm was not just chores with an allowance, it was their job. When the boys were in high school, they uh, had to have a car, had to have money, and we had a job. So two plus two equaled four. They learned the work ethic, they got to make some money, manage their money, and uh, very educational for, for the kids as they were growing up. Eventually, all of their children graduated from high school and began to move away to college. This meant that the Hansons were losing most of their workforce. Jay and Jean reached a crossroads. Was it time for them to retire and sell the farm that had been in the family for nearly 150 years? Or would one of their children come home and take over the farm? I wasn't real sure what was going to happen. I know there was a point when we, we talked about selling. You know, we talked a little bit about, you know, if the kids aren't going to come back, how long do we want to do it? And we didn't know. Between 2002 and 2004, all of their sons had come back to the farm. In order to support the entire family, they needed to expand their dairy operation. And at that same time, we were introduced to the uh, value added on farm processing. And we all studied it and decided that this is the way we wanted to go. On-farm processing would involve the Hansons building a creamery to process their raw milk, packaging it under their very own label, and distributing the milk directly to the customers. We had to form a, a business plan. How can we make it happen? And then uh, there's a lot of research involved as far as um, how you want to design it, um, what kind of equipment, what kind of pasteurization, what kind of products. To keep their product as close to raw milk as possible, they plan to produce unhomogenized milk. Homogenization is a process that breaks down milk molecules so that they are distributed evenly. The Hansen's milk would need to be shaken before being consumed. Because their product was so different from what was being sold in stores, the family needed to educate the general public. It was education, absolutely, absolutely. Why do we have to shake our milk? We're drinking skim milk. Why do we have to shake it? There's no fat in skim milk. So, yeah, it was, it was a challenge educating them. And when you're sampling, hand somebody a glass of milk, why all milk is the same? Why, what's different about this milk? It's a challenge. That part's a challenge, getting people to taste the milk. Helping customers understand their unique product was key for the Hansons moving forward. Their persistence paid off, and their milk became a popular item in local stores. When we first started out, we were just were in three stores. They were local. I think it was Traer, Rhinebeck, and Hudson. And Roots. And Roots Market in Cedar Falls. So those were the four that we started with. After that, everybody called us. We didn't have to go to the store and say, will you carry our products? They called us and said, we need your products. Okay. After a successful start, the family found their sales beginning to plateau. But as luck would have it, competing milk prices began to rise, and they were able to keep their prices the same. As they became the cheapest milk in town, they sold out of their supply and gained many loyal customers. This boost in sales also spurred on ideas for growth and product development. 50% of our sales is skim milk. Therefore, we have this cream, all this cream, what do we do with it? So we were wasting our cream, we were dumping it. Ice cream is one product that uses cream 
and butter is another product that uses cream. So those two products were added. Well, we weren't in this situation out here where we could market ice cream. So that forced us into retail at Muru. A year later, we knew we had a market in Cedar Falls because we were doing this farmer's market. And so we were able to continue the market and then we found the place in Cedar Falls. So, okay, this is our retail store for Cedar Falls. It started out, it was gonna be a temporary. <laughs> As it turned out, it's permanent. At the stores, the Hansons sold their dairy products along with other locally grown and produced items. To make sure that the retail locations got off to a solid start, Jay and Jean spent many hours behind the counter. They not only ran the register, but also continued to educate their customers. We, we used to receive comments when we opened our store up in town. Why would you want to do this? You know, it takes so much work. We just smiled and say, you have never worked on a dairy farm, have you? <laughs> At night when you leave that store, you can lock the door and not worry about it till the next morning. <clears throat> you can't do that with a, with a group of dairy cows. These days, all four Hanson sons help run the business, with every family member overseeing a different part of the operation. We all have talents in our own areas. Rather than everybody doing everything, everybody takes care of of what they are best at. And fortunately, that's how it, it worked out. Everybody is in a position where uh, they're maximizing their uh, talents, abilities, and passions. What began as a family dream is now a household name in the Cedar Valley. And as they look to the future, the Hansons don't take their success for granted. It's awesome, but we've been blessed. You know, we can't do it by ourselves without him. And it's very important that we respect that. And it, uh, it's been good. The journey's been good. It was, it was a huge risk that paid off. It's not really a job, it's more of a lifestyle. And raising a family on the farm is, is by far the best thing you can do by you know, it teaches them responsibility and, and, uh, and freedom, basically. They can basically do whatever they want and, and they just have fun doing it. The Hansen Farm has stood the test of time and is entering its seventh generation. Growing up on the farm is a tradition for the Hansons, and it is a tradition that doesn't seem to show any signs of fading.